You all clearly know who you are here to hear this morning. <laughs> and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna give you the information about Janine that I'm, I'm sure that you know, you, you've read over and over again. She's inspired us all. What I wanna share with you is um, really what's happening. Um, I don't know her talk, but I know that those of us that are really deeply immersed in biomimicry get very emotional when we think about this journey that we're on how it's built over time. Janine and her book and the ideas and the questions, the big what if questions that she has seeded in all of us have catalyzed a movement. And at first biomimicry was about products and then it became about systems and then it became about cities. Now it's about all of us in this room. I want you to think really, really big with Janine this morning. I want all of you to find a way to contemplate your aspect in this. What is your role? How are you contributing to sort of really growing this movement? Because we're all a really diverse group of people here with diverse backgrounds, um, industries that we're connected to, various sort of ways that we interact in those industries. But we're all, you know, doing our part to impact change. That's why we're here at ECO first and foremost. But I think there's something really vitally important about the message that Janine is going to deliver with us this morning that will be a series of provocations to challenge, like, have we done enough? Have we been thinking about it in the right way? Um, I don't want to take up any more valuable time for her to share um, her message with you, but just please give her a big, warm welcome and open up your hearts, your minds. It is so good to see you all. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, God, you can't imagine what this is like for me. Like a big wedding, big fat Greek wedding. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Um, so welcome to the reunion. Um, and the ecology of hope. As David Orr says, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. Hello, Texas. You know, um, it's not a time for rolling in a ball. It's a time for reaching. And I believe wholeheartedly in the power of aspirational goals. For us as a species, for us as a movement, um, that's how we've gotten to where we are, having the unshakable faith before anybody else did that people would want to come back home to this planet way before we go to asteroids. <laughs> As a full participant and a welcome species. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's simple. It's a conscious emulation of 3.8 billion years of brilliance, time-tested wisdom, not just information or data or knowledge, wisdom the embodied wisdom of living well in place. What is most important about biomimicry is it represents a, a new relationship between us and the rest of the natural world, not as dominators, but as students. It's not about domesticating. It's not about extracting. It's about learning from, not just about, but from. And it's about valuing nature like we never have before. And in that, valuing ourselves and each other. So, okay, this guy, I just saw, I, can't, I have chills, I just came from Bozeman, Montana, where he, at 86, E.O. Wilson, flew out to give me, us, an award. The E.O. Wilson Award for uh, Biodiversity and Technology Pioneer. How does that work where he gives me an award? You know, he's my superhero. He's like the Darwin of our era. He's this paradigm spawning biologist who writes like an angel. Um, and he's a true gentleman too. He's 86. And uh, he wanted me to tell you to thank you for what you're doing with biomimicry because his whole life has been devoted 
to trying to let us all know we live on a competent planet and it needs help right now. <laughs> needs, our, needs us to participate in it in a different way. And he gets biomimicry. He really, really does. So anyway, when I was preparing to accept this award on behalf of all of you who are working in biomimicry, um, I just get to wear the cape, <laughs> you guys. But you guys are lifting me on the, you guys are the swallows, right? Fly in me there. As I was getting ready, I went back and I looked at the E.O. Wilson quotes that I had in my book. So I had to go back to my book. And to tell you the truth, I haven't read anything in my book for the long, I mean, to me it's kind of the height of vainglory to read my own book when all of you are read, writing books that I need to read and they're on my bedstand, so I don't. And I went back and I read the last chapter because there were a lot of E.O. Wilson quotes. And you know what? While I was sitting there, here, it's the pond I write about in the book, and that's where, if you saw the video last night, I was sitting in front of that. But while I was sitting there writing the book, <laughs> um, feeling like I was making it up, the last chapter my editor said, you have to have an agenda chapter. And I said, well, I, don't, I, don't, I can't be prescriptive on this. And that last chapter is sort of like what we should do next. We've done it. If you go back and look, it's, it's, I said, let's educate in the estuary. You know, let's have biologists and engineers together. Let's have uh, an innovation matchmaker with this new thing called the internet, ask nature. <laughs> um, let's have university degrees. We just had this big education summit. Um, let's have a consultancy where there's biologists who work with inventors. Dana Baumeister shows up. Right? So Dana, Beth, Chris, Bryony, Nicole, all these people, the whole staff, have made these two organizations everything that we talked about, or I talked about in this book. Sitting there, making it up, has happened. And it's really moved from, and who knew that the global networks would be here? Oh my God. Oh my God. You just popped up like mushrooms, like fairy mushrooms around, like woo! <laughs> and the work has moved from a meme to a movement now. It's, and the question is, um, how will? <laughs> it's still the same question. In the book, I, you know, the chapters were, how will we grow food? How will we heal ourselves? How will we, right? How will we, uh, build our homes. So there's a whole new set of questions now. And this is the most important one. When I say a welcome species, I mean a species that fits in here in a way that is, that, that is not just benign, but benevolent and, and welcome, generous. Part of the big cycles. You might want to hold hands for this. Um, because it's hard to watch. So I want us to watch it together. Um, and it has to do with what we need to do next. This is a NASA uh, video. This is a year. The orange and red is carbon dioxide. The white is carbon monoxide. This is the exhale of us and our planet. The exhale, it's our signature right now right now, and it's important for us to see it because I think biomimicry has a lot to do with changing the complexion of this signature, okay? So, this is January. You see North America, you see the North. Whereas that's where the carbon dioxide is coming from, right? Each day goes by. More and more builds up. It's kind of hard to watch. This is February. March. Whoa, it's getting hot in here. Or is it just me? That's us right now. That's our exhale. That's what we're doing. Hey, wait a minute. Something's changing here. Something is changing. It's August. 
Where did all that carbon dioxide go? That's the signature of photosynthesis. That's the signature of all the green plants, algae, pulling that carbon back down. That's the kind of world we can breathe in and live in. Whew, love August. Thank you. Thank you, planet. But you know, it's getting on to be fall now. September. Some of the leaves are turning. The chlorophyll's being reabsorbed into the plants. The leaves are falling now. It's November, and it gets crazy again. It gets real crazy. Merry Christmas. <laughs> what shall we do together as biomimics? <laughs> So I spent a lot of the summer on a hammock. I'm working on a new book. And one of the things I read was the IPCC report, 2014, the latest one, Summary for Policymakers. Imagine hammock in front of the pond reading this, me who loves the sweet world. Surface temperatures will remain approximately constant at elevated levels for many centuries after a complete six, that means after we stop emitting everything, I said, no, that's, that, can't be, that can't be so. This is the next sentence. A large fraction of the climate change effects, according to uh, man-made, right, resulting from CO2 emissions is irreversible on a multi-century to millennial time scale. I closed my laptop. I went, this can't be. And I opened it up again for this last phrase. Except in the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, over a sustained period. Trees can do it, and so can we. With their help, our job now is to help the helpers. What shall we do together as biomimics? The interesting thing is, this is the era of systems level biomimicry. Form, process, we've been working on, this is systems biomimicry now, systems level. And here it is. It's as simple as this. We've got to draw down that carbon back to where it needs to be. We need to do carbon farming in nature's image. So what's interesting about this is the first chapter in the book is about agriculture. It's about prairie-inspired agriculture. Do you know how hippie that sounded? Do you know that every UN document I'm reading now is about carbon removal? And do you know what the largest contribute? Not only do we need to stop emitting, but we need to take back that carbon dioxide. And the, one of the largest ways we can do that is through, guess what? Biomimetic agriculture. Because in the last 200 years, we've lost 50% of our carbon in our soils. So it's like a giant bathtub that's half full now of carbon, of organic carbon. Because we, we tilled it up, we put chemicals on it, we killed all the organisms that keep the carbon sequestered down deep in centuries-long sequestration. We killed them, we tilled it up, we lost all that carbon. So we've got a giant reservoir waiting to pull that carbon down now. That's the good news. But the kinds of agriculture that will do that is agriculture that has very little to do really with individual plants. It has to do with systems. It has to do with plants and their helpers. The ecosystem-inspired agriculture, it's the prairie, the perennial polyculture inspiring a new kind of grain agriculture. There's perennial wheat research everywhere now. There's cover cropping. It's now happening, right? Perennials in the field are not hippie anymore. There's rotational grazing, which is based on 
ungulates and how native ungulates like buffalo would go and, and, and really, really eat down grasses and then move on. What that did was it caused the grasses to create long, deep roots. Those deep roots put out sugars. They take carbon dioxide, they turn it into sugars, they put out exudates, pull in all of these microbes, all of these fungi, who then have that carbon sequestered for centuries. So Project Drawdown, the carbon underground. Check out some of these things. The carbon removal project. We're not talking mirrors. We're not talking geoengineering. We're talking biosequestration. Project Drawdown, Paul's working on it, Paul Hawken. I'm on the board. It's 100 technologies and they're counting which ones between now and 2045, if you scaled them up, which ones would pull down carbon as we must to get below two degrees and back to the context that the organisms evolved in. Of, they don't have the, the data yet. They're, they're doing giant models. But here's what it's looking like. Out of the 100, the top 20 are really pulling most of the weight, and in the top 20, Guess what it is? Biosequestration. It's biomimetic agriculture and CO2 as a feedstock for stuff. All the stuff that seemed so wild haired. This is the kind of thing I wake up to now, right? From this, uh, here's a hippie mag here for you, her Forbes. <laughs> yeah. It's like I, I rub the sleep out of my eyes. I'm like, is this really happening? Yeah, this is, um, this is Rus Rusty Rodriguez. This is his work where he looked at the hot springs and he looked at uh, panic grass growing there. And he said, how can you grow next to something so hot? And he realized it's not the plant alone. Of course, it's this fungal helper. So now in symbiogenetics and advanced symbionics, he's doing a nonprofit. He's helping to take local fungi, inoculate seeds. He can grow rice with five times the productivity in half the water because of the fungal helpers. Really, really amazing work. Um, because roots are not in splendid isolation. When you see this, fungal bodies above, this is what's below. And we're beginning to get hipped to this. There are fungal helpers that are wrapped around roots. And in the past, we thought, okay, we, we understood this for a long, long time. The fungal helpers take the phosphorus, give it to the tree, the tree gives the fungal helpers carbon. But now we know it's a lot more complex and wondrous than we even imagined. Because it's not one-to-one -one partnerships. It's a party. It's a network. So this is uh, Dr. Suzanne Samard. And she's a woman who in, has been figuring out what's called carbon allocation studies. What that means is there's something called the common mycorrhizal network. It's not that the fungi is attached to a plant and they're by themselves in some sort of a business deal. <laughs> That's not it at all. That fungi, of course, is connected there, but that fungi goes out and it wraps around another root and it wraps around another root. So what she did, she and others, they tagged, radio tagged carbon. And so they could see that, oh, this tree is, is, is uh, fixing carbon, and then the carbon would go down the tree through the fungal helpers, and that carbon fixed by this tree would wind up in a shrub a half an acre away. They kept digging and digging and, and, and looking and DNA fingerprinting the soil, and they realized that there's what they now call a wood-wide web under there. <laughs> One tree gets carbon, gives it to another shrub in the shade. That shrub is getting hit by caterpillars. It sends alarm signals back to all the trees around it so that by the time the caterpillars get there, the trees have beefed up their defenses. They're exchanging water molecules. They're exchanging nitrogen. They're exchanging phosphorus. That's what it looks like. It's that, what, dig down and see that cobwebby, carefully, <laughs> that cobwebby stuff. That's really what a forest looks like. Does our, do our croplands look like that? Certainly prairies look like that. There's a chemical conversation going on that's helping each and every one of these plants be robust in times of drought, sponsor their own fertility, 
protect themselves from pests, protect each other. Here's what happens. In that kind of a field, we, thinking we were doing the best we could, we opened bags of nitrogen fertilizer. We opened bags of phosphorus. When we open bags of phosphorus and put it on these soils, we tell the mycorrhizal helpers they are not needed. And so these fields don't have that kind of mycorrhizal diversity. You know the microbiome in your own body? You know, in your gut and all? There's a microbiome in the soil. And we've been putting chemicals on it for a long, long time. Now we need it not just for our food, but to draw down carbon. This is an amazing nexus that's happening now, and it's going to happen very quickly. So I think the new agricultural quest and the new medicine quest, by the way, for our own microbiome is how do we help the helpers? How do we create conditions conducive to that assembly? And that's going to take a new kind of biomimetic inquiry. We're going to have to go to healthy soil complexes, and we're going to say, how are you doing that? And we're going to say, how can we help you do it? Creating conditions conducive. Who, how many people were at the awards ceremony last night for our Biomimicry Global Design Challenge? Okay. I don't know what penthouse protozoa means, but I like it. Um, these guys are from Oregon. Um, we have a, a Global Design Challenge, and uh, uh, these guys are competing to win a $100,000 Ray of Hope Prize. Uh, we're collaborating with the Ray Ander Racy Anderson Foundation. Uh, and the Biomimicry Institute. So check this out. I didn't even know this. Farm fields, corn fields are in the Midwest, have drainage pipes in them to drain out excess water. With that excess water comes nitrogen, phosphorus, all these fertilizers that we're putting on. They go out, and where do they go? Gulf of Mexico, right? Dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, eutrophication. So they said, well, that's not good, you know, that's not good at all. So they studied um, four different systems of, of microbes, earthworms, that in healthy soils are absorbing all of those nutrients. And you know they absorb the nutrients and then they give it back to the plant. So they have created uh, a substitute drainage pipe that has four parts. And it has, that last part is a mycorrhizal, uh, a cuff with mycorrhizal fungi. It's inoculated with microbes. And those, of course, will grow out into the fields. And the idea is, as that water comes and with all those beautiful nutrients, the pipe itself will absorb it. It's a living filtration system, it's called, and then feed it back to the plant. Where are they? Are they here? There they are up there. This was their process of biomimetic innovation. These are all their natural models, okay? This is now, thanks to Dana Baumeister, who's been teaching how to do biomimicry for all these years. And all of, how many people have taken a biomimicry class in here? The, you know this. This is the, this is the, um, this is, these are their models. Chile. We have, we had registrants from 70 countries in the biomimicry design challenge. Uh, this was a team bio nurse from Chile. Uh, industrial designers, agronomists, beautiful, incredible soil, soil regeneration. They looked at the cushion plant for soil healing. One of the problems they have in Chile is they have these fruit orchards, and, and they, when, they, when they cut a tree, when it's, when it's uh, past its time, and they cut a fruit tree, the next year it's less than 50% productivity, what's going on? It's not the tree, it's the soils. Brand new tree planted, it's the soils. So what they did was they went to the harshest parts of mountaintops and said, how does bedrock get turned into soil? How do plants handle really harsh conditions and actually create soil? This is a plant called a cushion plant. And what you can't see, it's like a mossy sort of thing and it's individual stems. But what's really interesting is there's spaces within those stems where other plants can get started and get going, but they're protected from the harsh winds and the UV light. So they're creating basically sort of like a mulch paddy that you can put down 
over those stumps or on any kind of soil that needs healing. And what they've done is they've looked at all the different plant functions that are necessary, different plants with different functions. This one's a deep-rooted one. This one's a legume. This one grabs water really well. They found which, what are the functions of soil regeneration? And they're making this patty that in, which, in which it comes with the seeds of all of those plants. You put it on the stump, the plants grow, the helpers are there. Can you imagine the paradigm shift of where normally we're like, we're planting a, tr a plant, let's weed everything around it, right? No, let's plant everything really, really close to it. Amazing, amazing. Where are they? The Chile group, are you guys here? <laughs> Biomimicry at a systems level. These are not individual solutions. We're going to put them into sets of solutions, uh, solutions, collections of solutions. We are surrounded by genius, and there's new data coming out all the time. Because I was with E.O. Wilson, looking at ants, had to. You should have seen his face when I put this up. He was like, oh. it was like I put a relative of his up or long, you know. Like, he kind of tilted his head. He kind of looks like an ant. Um, he does. He went. He went. Just really amazing. Anyway, this is a harvester ant, and they're in our backyard. Um, they're amazing. They make, make these huge mounds, and those are their bedroom chambers. So they go very deep. That's about, yeah, really amazing. So what's interesting about them is that, well, there's 30 trillion plants, um, ants on the planet. So, you know, huge numbers. And they're down there in the soils. What are they doing down there? Well, a researcher put... There's another way to pull down carbon is by accelerating weathering of rocks because dissolved carbon dioxide will sort of sequester onto rocks, okay? He put all these rocks in different places over 25 years, and as he pulled them up, he started to realize that the ones that were near ants accelerated carbon dioxide removal and sequestration by 335 times. So what, and they don't even know yet, is it a chemical that the ant's putting out? Rocks near ants sequestering. This was the headline in Scientific American. Ants may boost CO2 absorption enough to slow global warming. Wow, right? So the biomimic asks, oh, please tell us how you're doing that. Please tell us how you're doing that, All right? Now, Here's the other thing, the nexus. Here's the opportunity. Smallholders. This is a term for 70% of our food is grown by a third of humanity. They're called smallholders. They're on less than five acres. Okay? When international aid came in to support the Green Revolution, which was industrialized agriculture, they said basically, just let's skip over the smallholders. But the smallholders continue to grow food for their families. Many of them grow food in organic ways and in regenerative ways by necessity. They're not yet opening bags of nitrogen and phosphorus. But they could start very soon, and here's why. The food and beverage companies about 10 years ago, because we love organic, began to run out of ingredients at the conventional level. So they are now going to smallholders, like Danone has 50,000 contract farmers that they get their ingredients from. This is a huge opportunity. I believe there should be a pledge for the food and beverage companies that they should say, we should say to them, we'd love to buy your product, but we'd love to know, are you supporting women farmers? Are you supporting a diversity of crops in those small holdings? not just the pomegranate that you're giving me? Are you reducing the costs of certification for organic for them? Are you helping them stay the course with their regenerative agriculture? Are you networking them? These smallholders represent a huge amount of the of planet's agriculture. And 
there's 6.8 billion acres of degraded land right now. Now our agriculture forestry is going to move into those areas. What kind? Let's make sure it's biomimetic. We have a huge opportunity here. The Global Design Challenge continues, by the way. You can apply for it. We're doing it uh, uh, a couple of years. So please, if you're interested. It's all about where am I time-wise? Help me. What time is it? 26 minutes left. Yes. OK. Are you hanging with me? OK. Very exciting. Our time has come, seriously. So I think what we need to do now is to participate in these large cycles. Have we been participating in the water cycle? Yes, but we've been a bit of a mess, you know? Um, we have to participate, literally, I have this vision of us getting in the flow, participating in the carbon cycle, participating in the water cycle, participating in the material cycle, in a way that we almost seamlessly disappear because we're functionally indistinguishable from the rest of the organisms that are doing their thing. We're just one of many. I mean, if the ants can do it, for God's sakes. <laughs> so there's all kinds of beautiful things happening. One of the things that life does very well is to concentrate the minuscule. Life doesn't go, most of life doesn't go and dig up big ores amounts to get metals. They get little bits of metal out of, they filter it, they concentrate photons, they concentrate fog droplets, and they filter, right? So they desalinate, they're amazing. The filtration, that's gonna be one of the big, big things that we need to learn from the natural world. So aquaporins, are in every one of your bl red blood cells. And what happens is, these are our shaped pores in the cells. And what they do is they, they because of their shape and their charges, the water molecules come in, they're pulled in, and everything else stays behind. It's forward osmosis instead of reverse osmosis. We push enormous amounts of seawater against membranes, and then we're like, why it's clogging? <laughs> you know? And, well, let's just put more energy there. Instead, imagine these pores and the water molecules are pulled through, creating salinity power at the same time. So the Danes uh, came up with aquaporin, which is a membrane that had these pores in it, but they had to get these pores from biological sources. So now what's happening, and this is, the ne this is how biomimicry advances, so we're not using bio-utilization, but so there's actually at Penn State now, the crazy, another hippie thing I, we talked about a long time was self-assembly. You know, basically a, a vat of, of molecules that would self-assemble into structures and into useful things, right? Like oil and water does, only it would be useful things. This is a low temperature self-assembly process where they're created pores that mimic these aquaporins. So imagine now these kinds of membranes, not just for salt, but to take all kinds of things out of wastewater. So now we're mining industrial polluted waters rather than veins of ore. Here's something. This is, we've got antibiotics floating in our uh, municipal water systems, right? right? And we, this is an, a huge issue. So how do you get antibiotics out of the water? Imagine a tea bag, a giant one, that you could put into the water and the antibiotics would jump into it. So this is a membrane that's based on, there are these pumps that bacteria have. And when you give them an antibiotic, do you know what they do? They pull it in, they're like, whoa, that's an antibiotic, that's a toxin for me, and they pump it out. They're called efflux pumps. So if you put those pumps in the tea bag edges, I, I mean in the, in, the, in the membranes of the tea bag, if you put those pumps backwards, the antibiotics jump into the tea bag. These are, these are elegant, elegant solutions. This is another um, biomimicry design challenge 
pipes leaking underground with this water that, because of buildup of, of uh, bubbles, basically build up in the pipes. This was design students two years ago. They figured this out, builds up, the bubbles build up, and then they become so big that it breaks the pipe. It's a big problem. They looked at fish gills because fish basically are taking air out of water. They put a device in the pipe that basically bleeds off the air out of the water before it builds up and breaks pipes. Another big, big area, a domain for biomimicry is to plug the leaks. Peat bog inspired floating beds, kind of like John Todd sorts of things, except on, on uh, mattresses that float around in water, again with the helpers. Septic systems that are based on how soil profiles work to, again, take those nutrients, but the water doesn't go down and out. The water goes back up and then is watering your lawn. California, this is an Australian uh, company called Biolytics. The Bullet Center in Seattle. This is an amazing, check this, check this case study out. Uh, an amazing biomimetic building. Um, but what I love the most, Dennis Hayes took me on this tour, the guy who's, who uh, started Earth Day, took me on this tour and we went downstairs. It's composting toilets, it's a six story, right? So it's net fertility. They're taking that compost and they're creating an ecosystem service of soil creation for the city. Anybody hear of bio-irrigators? This is a new thing. This is a really cool thing. Anybody who's a gardener or a landscape architect in a city. So bio-irrigators, there are plants in forests that do what's called hydraulic redistribution. So for instance, in the rainforest, 10% of the rainfall falls, and then there are these deep-rooted shrubs in the rainforest. They have shallow roots and they have deep roots, both. The water comes in through the shallow roots, and believe it or not, against intuitive sense, they push the water down the roots, not up the roots, down the roots and out into the soil to bank it. So they bank the soil, and then during the dry season, they pick it up, they put it back up the tap root for themselves, yes, but they also put it out the shallow roots and they water the whole forest. There's mutualism going on here, for sure. So now, gardeners are starting to plant these plants in the middle of their gardens. The plants water, it's a self-watering landscape. Really important stuff. Another cycle the material cycle. This time it's not, first I asked, how will we make things? Now I want to know how will we reincarnate what we make? <laughs> because nature has no landfills, right? Look at this picture, <laughs> right? That can't wait to have those materials into, into something, a second life, right? In the natural world, what's rare is too hard to procure. What's abundant, carbon dioxide, is golden. And this is too precious to waste. Look at all the materials there. So what happens is the log becomes the fungus. The materials in the log become the fungus. It's upcycle, new product. The fungus, chewed by the vole, becomes the vole. And the vole becomes the owl. Reincarnation. It's local, it's safe, it's cyclic. I honestly think carbon, Pollution, I should have put that in this, because it's like, great, carbon is our supply chain. To make fuels, split water with sunlight, another hippie idea, artificial photosynthesis, <laughs> it's gonna happen. We're learning how to split water with solar, with a solar cell, split water, bubble off the hydrogen, right? take carbon dioxide, which is what a plant does, and start to make stuff with it. So solar chemistry, photons to fuel, photons to stuff, CO2 to stuff. A really important bacteria-inspired catalyst was just discovered that easily 
turns methane into fuel. There are eight carbon dioxide to plastics and to uh, cement companies right now. In the UN report, I recently read. I mean, it is not, this is called carbon removal. These are called net, uh, carbon negative materials. And they are on the list. The IPCC report, get a hammock and a bourbon to read it. <laughs> not kidding you. But it's great. It, it really has, it has mitigation strategies. It has a thousand of them. And these are, are right there. This is, a, this is a chair. It's a plastic that's created from CO2 using catalysts that were mimicked from plants. Coral reef mimicry, the me recipe for the coral, taking CO2 out of smokestacks, bubbling through seawater, creating the raw materials for building materials like cement, concrete, drywall. <laughs> Imagine your buildings sequestering carbon dioxide. Reincarnating is going to happen locally. This is, this is the pond, that's our house there. It's coming home because of this, because of bottom-up, self-assembling. It's, it's, it's getting very biomimetic lately, right? Building from the bottom up. These printers are getting cheaper and cheaper. Beautiful, this is nervous system, beautiful designs. These are biomimetic algorithms made into lamps and jewelry and oh my gosh. Products won't cross the globe, designs will. But here's the question. <laughs> what are we putting in those printers? And are we getting back those lamps at the end of their life, right? Beetle, one material. Candy wrapper, seven different materials <laughs> to do all those functions. One material system. It's a system, it's a composite. So it's, it's a single system. <laughs> Why is that so complicated for us? Here's what's gonna happen. This is Lillian Vandal's biomimicry chair. One material system. Using structure to create comfort. Plant cell model, right? And then at the end of its life, it goes back to what? The printer. So here's where biomimicry intervenes in the making, the story of stuff. The supply chain, CO2, or waste cellulose. The build files, the structure, the printer chemistry, self-assembling, low temperature, low toxicity, and then returning to the disassembly processes to return to the printer. We have to get involved in this movement. <laughs> Finally, our cities. As Kathy said, it it's just keeps on going. Um, cities have to function like the wildland next door. What will it take? You know what it's gonna take? David Orr again. You know how you make a sustainable world, says David Orr? You create a culture that desires it. I think biomimicry, it, our time is here because our desire has changed. Watch this, 1939, 40 million people went to the New York World Fair. A third of our country went to find their future. There were buttons that said, I've seen the future. When you left the GM ride, which was called Futurama, and everybody looked, and this was our future. Oh, and this was like these dioramas, you know, and people would ride by and look at them. Whoa, that's what we wanted so badly. There was not a highway system at this time in this country. GM wanted this very badly. Oh, this is what we desired. And this is what we got. We did it. What is changed now? That's what we want now. Look online at all the city design contests. They all look like this. This is our time for biomimicry. Look, this is our time, because our desire has changed. Cities need to be generous, as generous as life. 
It may not look like that, although it's increasingly, but it has to function like that, right? When I say generous, I mean ecosystem services. That's what, that's what these systems give us. They mitigate drought, they disperse seeds, they purify the air, they build soil. These are things we haven't asked ourselves to do, right? They stop erosion of that beautiful soil, they stop the hemorrhaging of that plasma, that soil plasma. They pollinate crops, right? They do all these things. They cycle and move nutrients. When I say we have to be part of the cycle, I mean we have to start doing this. Ecological performance standards at Biomimicry 3.8, we work with cities. We tell the city managers, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna check out the wildland next door and we're gonna figure out how much water is being purified, how much air is being purified, and then that's your per acre metric. That's your new key performance indicator. Add up all the design interventions and try to get from current performance to the ecological performance, right? Water collection and storage. Now you know how many gallons of water in a storm you need to store because the wildland next door does it, right? Water filtration, evapotranspiration, nitrogen and phosphorus. These ecosystem service metrics allow us to not just say we're gonna participate in the cycles, they give us an aspirational goal. <laughs> and it's high, believe me, it's super high, but it's a beautiful framework to design into. Every design intervention, you start to count. And it's not just, it's not just the, here's the, it's not just planting trees. These buildings, there's a building there that what, the air that leaves it is three times cleaner. It's Bank of America building, Bob Fox's building, three times cleaner than the air that comes in. So that's an ecosystem service building. What if all the buildings had that metric, right? What if the infrastructure and the ecostructure, together we counted it up and said, oh, we're exhaling pure air this year. Every building, multiple ecosystem services, achieved by every design. And the best designers in the world are starting to design this way. So let's give them a reason, here's Missoula, Cumulative benefit over time. <laughs> Stuart Kaufman has this, this idea called the adjacent possible, which is that in evolution, um, you, you, you couldn't have one thing happen. You know, you couldn't have woodpeckers until you had insects in trunks of trees, right? It created the tree, the insect created the adjacent, they, it was, it created the adjacent possible for woodpeckers. And everything we do in biomimicry, every single thing you're working on, every demonstration that you're working on, students, professionals, is creating the adjacent possible for biomimicry. <laughs> Imagine Mission Generous. We're working with Interface right now and we're looking at one factory in Australia and seeing if that factory can create net ecosystem services. <laughs> what if we did that in every town, every community? That's Missoula. <laughs> what if you fly over Missoula and you're flying over the wilderness and you're like, oh, beautiful fragrant air, clear running water, perfect. And then you fly over the city and nothing changes. It's still the same exhale. It's goodness billowing up. Why not? If we're gonna do this, we have to figure out how to do it together. We have to actually bring biomimicry into social innovation. We have to first stop believing that we're alone. I'm gonna show you another blow your mind, boom, boom, for a biologist, paper. Very messy hammock this summer. <laughs> this is the quarterly review of biology. Look at this font. This is still the way it looks. It's very serious. This is the headline, a symbiotic view of life. We have never been individuals. <laughs> what? what? It is an amazing, amazing, it is, it is like, write this down. This is, they're saying immuno, immunologically, we are not individuals. Our gut microbes help us. They help us uh, protect us from, the, you know, nine out of 10 of our cells are not human, right? They help us 
fight disease. We are not individuals uh, genetically. <laughs> There's all this genome that's in us, and it moves from generation to generation. We're not individuals uh, 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 it starts, I mean, it, it's, I just got a five minute warning, so I, I, have to, I have to think of this. It starts at the cell level. We are not individuals, okay? We are a symbiosis, right, of, of bacteria that once jumped in and we ingested them but didn't digest them. Every plant cell is a symbiosis, right? So at the cellular level, we're not individuals. What, it, what does it mean to have all of this colony living here? What is natural selection working on? And if you think of this, if you think of the plant idea that I was talking about and how it's so dependent on its other partners and it actually puts out sugars and pulls them in, is natural selection, they're saying evolutionarily, we may not be individuals. In other words, natural selection, everything we know about evolution is based on the individual. What if we're selecting for partnership characteristics? What if being a good partner, a good mutualist, a generous species is what constitutes success? The science, when the science changes like this, our whole idea of competition changes. And we realize that we have to start looking at some of these deeper level life's principles. How does nature self-organize? How does nature cooperate? How does nature form networks and maintain them so beautifully? How does nature create resilience? It does it together, believe me, it does it as community. And finally, how does nature grow? How does nature not just get bigger, but better. Growth is a big one for us. How does nature communicate? These are life's principles. I'm working on a new book called Ubiquity, which is about the things that all organisms have in common that we don't know about and we probably should. Uh, and many of them are things that will guide our social innovation. Toby Herzlick has started Biomimicry for Social Innovation and you're talking 445. This is what makes me smile. That's from my office window. <laughs> um, that's our home. And um, it's everything, and my partner Laura is here. Where's Laura? My partner Laura is here. Everything I know about being a good species, <laughs> I learned here. Because we moved there and, and, and it was, oh, it was, a, it was a Sand County Almanac kind of thing. It was a very, very trashed, trashed property. It had been overgrazed. It had been hard, hard beaten. It was full of 100% knapweed, which is an invasive. It was, oh, it was hurting. And so we have tried to be uh, participants. And Laura, we were, we were out on that field uh, just recently, this spring, and we go out sometimes with glasses of wine and watch the grass grow. And, and, um, and you said to me, close your eyes and imagine that none of these houses are here. Imagine that we're part of this watershed. No boundary lines, no property lines. Imagine Willoughby. We have two, we have two creeks, South Willoughby and North Willoughby, crashing through our, our property and these two, these two ponds. And so I could imagine all the way up in the sapphires, all the way down to the Bitterroot River, this whole catchment. And we were just a part of it, just a beautiful flow in it. Thank you, Laura. It was, I, I encourage you to do that no matter where you're living, in the middle of a city, imagine it. This is when we get confirmation that we're maybe doing something right. These are my baby pictures. This is Sandhill Crane. We've had them now for four years coming to our property and when to breed. And when these guys who have like almost 10 foot wingspans come, Laura says to me, honey, the pterodactyls are back. <laughs> Seriously, they come in, it's like, oh, and they go, they're like, oh, 
you're in the house, but you can hear them. You go running out. You're like, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks. Maybe we're doing it right. Maybe we're doing something right. You're going to breathe. Yes, you are. You're dancing. And then they have these cults. They're called cults. Isn't that good? And uh, at the end of the season, right about now, we watch them give flying lessons all year. And, uh, and they take off like that, you know. Um, and they fly to the Arctic, where, thankfully, we have a reprieve. Thank you. I think of them up there, because that's where they go. Um, these guys, um, it's like when you have that kind of majesty grace you, right? A visitation from something so wild on your, the property that you've loved back into being. That's what it's gonna feel like for us to be a welcome species. And I know we're gonna get there. Not alone. We're gonna get there with these organisms that are so wise and so generous. And our desire needs to be not just that we admire them, but that we want to be just like them. And biomimicry is getting us there. This movement is composed of people who want that, who desire that. And it is overwhelming for me to see what's happened. And I can't wait to see where you'll fly next. Thank you.